Hey, so. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Doing good, okay. I'm Jessica, um, and yeah, I'm gonna talk about my favorite thing to talk about, which is nearby galaxies and what we can learn by looking at them in the infrared. Um, before I get into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about who I am. So like I said, um, I'm Dr. Jessica Sutter. I don't usually call myself a doctor, though, because it scares me. Um, I. When I was in Wyoming, I did a lot more skiing. I love being outside however I can when I'm not looking at the space. So that's me and my dad um, backpacking in Tasmania after going to an astronomy conference. Um, sometimes I also take my cat outside on a harness. He really liked being here in the Bay Area. He likes it. He liked it better than San Diego, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> when, when I worked here, I worked with SOFIA. As we said, this is a telescope on an airplane. So SOFIA stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. What what you're going to notice throughout this talk, there's a lot of acronyms. Astronomers really like acronyms, and we're pretty terrible at making them, so SOFIA was a pretty good one. But um, SOFIA was a far infrared telescope that flew above most of the water vapor in our atmosphere so it could view the universe in the infrared. Water blocks infrared light, so you have to get above that if you want to see that. So that hole right there is where the telescope was. It would look up and it got a lot of great observations. It was retired earlier this year, um, so sadly no more SOFIA flights, but um, it provided a lot, of, a lot of great data while it was going. So, like I said, I'm not here to talk about myself, though. Um, that would be a boring talk. Um, I'm here to talk about galaxies. So I think the first thing we need to establish is just what is a galaxy. So if you all will do me a little favor, um, I want you to take a moment to close your eyes and think of just Picture what you think of when you hear the word galaxy. And so when you've got that image in your head, when you're thinking galaxy, you've got that image of a galaxy, you can go ahead and open your eyes. How many of you have thought of something that looked like this? Can I see hands? Okay, A plus, 100%, you're all right, this is a galaxy, good job. Um, but what you, how many of you thought of something that looks like this? Uh, okay, so we have some people who know what a galaxy is. This is also a galaxy. Um, this is what um, astronomers might call an elliptical galaxy. So elliptical because it's not flat, it's kind of more three-dimensional, somewhat football-shaped. We sometimes also call these red and dead galaxies because unlike this beautiful spiral galaxy, um, this galaxy doesn't have a lot of colors. So it's mostly, we call it red, it's maybe more yellow, we can argue about that. Um, but it's also not forming any more stars. So this galaxy is dead in that it's not forming stars anymore. Our lovely spiral has a ton of blue light. That blue light tells me that there's a lot of really young stars here. Only young stars really put out blue light. There's also some of these red bubbles that are probably star-forming regions. That's actually hydrogen gas. So one of the big questions in extragalactic, extragalactic astronomers are asking is what determines if a galaxy looks like this one or if a galaxy looks like this one? What in its lifetime might make it stop forming stars and lose its spiral structure. So there's a lot of ways we can try to answer this question, um, but um, as we do this, sorry, I should, uh, uh, I wanted just to give us a little bit more of this kind of what is a galaxy. So this is the International Astronomical Union's definition of a galaxy, a galaxy being a group of stars, dust, gas, and dark matter held together by gravity with a supermassive black hole in the center. And I do want to point out that like, we, as Western scientists, really like putting things in boxes. The universe doesn't really like to put things in boxes. So are there things that we call galaxies that break every single part of this definition? Probably, if there's a galaxy without stars, we can't observe it because that's how we observe galaxies. So eh, I don't know about that one, but there's definitely, there do seem to be galaxies without dark matter. There do seem to be galaxies without supermassive black holes in the center. There are galaxies with very low gas and dust. Um, they do have to be held together somehow to call them an individual thing. Um, but the other thing that's really great about galaxies is that they host most of the matter in our universe. So both the dark matter and the luminous matter, so the stuff we interact with, we sometimes call this baryonic matter, but anything proton, neutrons, electrons, all of the stuff that makes us up, everything, all of that stuff in the universe pretty much is in galaxies. So by studying how galaxies evolve over time, we're also studying the history of the stuff that makes us, the stuff that makes our Earth, the stuff that makes the food you ate on your way here. If you had a cup of coffee, the stuff in that coffee was made in our galaxy. So understanding how galaxies grow over time, this 
is where heavy elements are formed. This is where we enrich the universe with heavier elements. If you have jewelry, that gold, that silver, all of this is processed. It didn't exist in the beginning of the universe, but it was processed and created in galaxies. So understanding the evolution of the galaxy of galaxies is really how we understand the evolution of our universe. So getting back to that question, what determines if a galaxy is blue and new or red and dead, a spiral or an elliptical, plays into this chemical evolution of the universe, how we go from a universe that's really mostly only hydrogen to a universe that has carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and all of the things that make us humans um, and allow us to exist here on Earth and then make life enjoyable with things like coffee and chocolate. Um, I know this isn't the history talk, but I wanted to give just a bit of an overview of how we know there are galaxies. So. Um, I think this is kind of mind-blowing. We've really only known that there are other galaxies besides the Milky Way, the one we're in, for about 100 years. It's actually a little less, about 1925. So that's 98 years ago. We really get confirmation that there are other galaxies. Um, so before this, we saw those kind of spiral objects in the sky. They were called spiral nebula. And astronomers thought they were just clouds of gas that were part of our bigger Milky Way galaxy that was the entire universe. There was a big debate in around 1920 between Harlow Shapley and H.D. Curtis, um, where they were arguing about whether those spiral nebula were their own island universes or whether they were part of our galaxy. Um, turns out a few years later, Edwin Hubble was able to measure the distance to the Andromeda Nebula um, pretty precisely and found that it was 2.57 million light years away. And with its brightness and that distance, it had to be something comparable to our own Milky Way. So this is where we get to learn that there must, these Andromeda Nebula, these other spiral nebula, have to be their own individual island universes or their own individual galaxies. And so this is really um, where we start to get to, to be able to do extragalactic astronomy is about 100 years ago, and that's what allows me to study the things I study now, which are their own galaxies um, in the universe. So this is pretty cool. This was also, a lot of this happened, Edwin Hubble's observations happened at the Wilson Observatory, so down outside LA. So some of you might have had a chance to go there as well. Um, I will talk about stuff that happened here too, I promise. Um, okay, so I've told you, uh, I've started, I've gotten a little bit of an introduction to galaxies. But I also told, we also said the title of this talk was the interstellar medium in the infrared. And I haven't talked about infrared at all yet. So I want to take a moment, so I want to jump back and think about what infrared light is. Now, how many of you know what this constellation is? You shout it out. Orion, yes. So this is what Orion looks like in visible light, maybe slightly enhanced for us to make it slightly prettier, but we've got Betelgeuse up there, we've got the nice belt. I always think Betelgeuse is the head, but it's the shoulder, I always forget that. Um, but we have the belt, we've got a little star forming region down here, the Orion Nebula, so there's some baby stars in there. But this is what it looks like to us, because we observe Orion in visible light, the stuff we as humans see. If instead we saw in the infrared, Orion would look like this. So it would look incredibly different. Um, the stars are no longer the brightest things. We can now see this Orion Nebula right here that looks it's visible in the optical, but it's now incredibly bright. It's the brightest thing in this constellation when we're looking in the infrared. And that's because when we look in the infrared, we are seeing a fundamentally different part of our galaxy. We're seeing a different component of the galaxy. Specifically, we're seeing a lot of dust and we're seeing a lot of gas. And this dust and gas is what we call the interstellar medium. It's the stuff between the stars. So interstellar is just between stars, medium, stuff. So stuff between stars. Um, gas and dust between stars. So if we zoom in to this little star forming region, so we're going to take a little tour. We'll see if this works. Um, this is from um, a combination of Hubble Space Telescope images and Spitzer images. So Spitzer is what we're looking at right now. This is what the Orion Nebula looks like in infrared light. And we can see that it's very, very bright. So this is a star forming region in our own galaxy that you can go out and see. You can point to it and you can say, there are baby stars up there in that, in that part of the Orion Nebula. And now we're flipping back to HST, so Hubble images going into optical light. And we can see that these clouds, especially these clouds of gas that were really bright in the infrared are now dark and they're pretty opaque as well. So you can't see through them if you look in the, in, in the optical. But if we switch 
to the infrared. The clouds are now very bright, and although it's hard to tell, especially if you look at the ones going up, they're slightly opaque, or they're slightly translucent. So when we look in the infrared, we can start to be able to see through the gas and dust as well. Um, in the infrared, we're also seeing a slightly different population of stars. We're seeing younger stars, and we're seeing light that would otherwise be blocked from us because of the dust and gas in the interstellar medium. So that's why the number of stars is also changing when we flip between our Hubble data here. We'll see if it's going to go to Spitzer again soon. How well am I timing this? Not very well, apparently. Um, this is still Hubble. Are you going to switch? There we go, we're going back to Spitzer now. So we can see, we're seeing a different depth into this nebula, we're seeing a different depth into this stellar nursery when we're looking in the infrared using Spitzer instead of looking in the optical using Hubble. So by looking in the infrared, we would see, we're seeing a part of our universe, a part of these galaxies that would be hidden to us if we only looked in optical. Now, just as a bit more um, of a definition of what infrared light is, this is kind of a typical, sorry, it's a lot brighter and less pretty, um, but um, typical kind of model of the electromagnetic spectrum. So electromagnetic spectrum is just all of the light that's out there. We humans observe a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible light. So this is that rainbow that we see, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. If we could see shorter wavelengths, higher energy light, things that are purpler than purple, we would be seeing ultraviolet light. So we, you might have heard of ultraviolet light when you're picking out your sunscreen because it blocks those UV light rays that can burn us. The sun is putting out ultraviolet light. Really young baby stars tend to put out a lot of ultraviolet light. Um, there's also, if you go even shorter, there's X-rays, and even shorter, there's gamma rays. But I'm really interested in the longer wavelength, lower energy stuff, so the infrared. So this is redder than red. So this is longer wavelength, lower energy light um, that we, than what, what, what we can see, and it's um, redder than what we can see. If we go to longer wavelengths, you get to microwave. So infrared, if you want numbers, is around one micron wavelength of one micron to about 500 or so microns. You can argue where that ends, but um, that's usually as far out as I go. Um, and then if you go even longer, you get to radio waves. Um, another place that we as humans might have experienced infrared light is if you've ever seen um, night vision goggles that look sort of like this. There's a few ways of doing night vision. One of them is to use infrared light, and that's because anything with a temperature emits infrared light. We are all emitting infrared light right now, unless you're dead then you're not emitting very much infrared light, but hopefully none of you are dead. Um, hopefully I'm not that boring. Um, but I'm emitting infrared light. This is an image of a deer in the infrared. We can see that because it has a temperature, it's emitting infrared light. So this is another place on Earth you may have seen some use of the infrared, but um, we're not talking about Earth. So what do we see when we look in space? Um, in space, again, anything with a temperature is going to emit infrared light. And, um, this is really specifically what we're looking at is a lot of times you're seeing dust, we're seeing gas, um, we're seeing planets, and we're seeing moons. So all of these things that maybe don't emit a lot of their own optical light. So when you guys all looked at the moon outside, what you were seeing was light reflected from the sun. So the sun, sunlight hit the moon, bounced off it, and you saw that reflected light. If we could see in the infrared, the moon has a temperature, it would be glowing in the infrared. This is not our moon, this is one of Saturn's moons. Um, oh my gosh, I am... Mimas, thank you. I'm so sorry, my brain turned off. Um, sometimes it gets called the Death Star Moon. Um, if you look in the infrared, it doesn't look like the Death Star, though. It looks like Pac-Man. Um, and we don't know exactly why, but there's theories that it has to do with um, how it's traveling around Saturn. Um, and there's a bunch of material around Saturn, both from the ring that's icy, and that could be causing part of it to be cooler than the other part. Um, there's also a lot of material around Saturn because one of Saturn's other moons, Enceladus, which if you have time after this, Enceladus is very, very cool, and you should look up Enceladus. Um, but Enceladus has ice geysers that are actually blasting ice out into space around Saturn. And so as Mimas moves around Saturn, it might be picking up some of that material and that might be changing the temperature on one side. But um, we can see that, again, looking at um, Mimas, it looks different in the infrared. But I am here to talk about galaxies, not moons. Um, I can talk about moons too, though. Um, 
And galaxies in the infrared, what we're really seeing is that dust emission. So we're seeing the interstellar medium, and we're especially seeing the dust in the interstellar medium. And so what you might notice, this is arguably one of the best galaxies, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, and uh, what you can see in the optical is that there's these kind of dark lines that go through the rings of the Whirlpool Galaxy. When we switch from the Hubble view on this side in the visible light, what we can see with our eyes to the infrared light from the Spitzer Space Telescope, we can see those dark lanes are matched really well with these very, very bright features. So those really bright features are dust in this galaxy, dust that's being heated by stars, so it's emitting infrared light, um, but it blocks the light from stars as well. So dust in galaxies can actually block visible light, which is why these things look dark, invisible. It's not that there's nothing there, it's that there's a lot of dust between us and those stars that's blocking that light and making it look dark. This is also the same reason the Milky Way, if you see it at night, if you're somewhere dark enough where you can see the Milky Way, there are dark streaks in the Milky Way. Those aren't areas that don't have stars, those are areas that are very, very dusty. Um, and so what you're seeing there isn't, again, a lack of stars, it's an overabundance of dust. If we could see in the infrared, those dark spots would be very, very, very bright. Um, this is just another view. This is one of the galaxies I study, NGC 7331. It doesn't have a fun name. Every once in a while I see it, it's called, the, it's in a group that they call like the deer tick group, but I don't really like that as a name. So NGC 7331, but we're flashing between the optical from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the infrared from Spitzer. And again, we can see that in the infrared, we're seeing that dust. We're seeing a fundamentally different part of this galaxy. So if we only looked in the optical, we would be missing a huge part of what's happening in galaxies. Another thing I really like to think about is that as astronomers, we're pretty limited in the data we have. There's a few exceptions to this, but almost all of our data comes to us in the form of light. So we really only have light to work with. If we only looked at optical light, we would be missing so much of the electromagnetic spectrum. So by expanding what we have, by not just restricting ourselves to what we as humans can see, um, uh, we get so much more data than if we only um, wanted to look at the um, optical part of the spectrum. So I keep saying dust. What do I mean by that? What is dust? Um, and so dust in galaxies is a little different than the dust we might find in our own homes, partially because I think I always hear that the dust we have in our houses is a large part human skin cells. I don't think any of the dust in our galaxy is human skin cells. I sure hope it's not. That would be weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, it isn't entirely different than some things we find on Earth. So these are pictures of dust grains that were actually um, gathered from uh, the or from from a mission that went into our solar system. So these are mostly from within our solar system where dust grains might be a little bit bigger, um, but we are getting things that look sort of like this. They're small, they're made of carbon or silicate, so elements that you might have encountered on Earth. Um, we also have a lot of these things up here that are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. I will talk more about those. But these are somewhat similar to um, wildfire smoke, so sorry. I'll have more about this, but um, we do get, it's not completely unlike um, dust on Earth, but the grains are a lot smaller, and they're mostly carbon and silicate. So, um, again, not totally different. Um, one thing that I found out while I was uh, doing, preparing this talk, was that one of the earliest discoveries, or the earliest propositions of dust in galaxies actually happened here. Um, so this was 1918. Uh, um, Curtis, who helped show that there are galaxies are not part of our own galaxy, uh, took images of edge-on spiral galaxies. So galaxies, so the spirally type galaxies, if you look at them instead of face-on, where you can see the spirals, if you're looking at them like this, so like we're seeing the edge of the pancake, um, you can kind of see, um, sorry, hopefully, I'm not doing something wrong. Um, you can see that there's these dark lines that are going through these galaxies. And he, he um, stipulated that that wasn't, again, that wasn't a lack of material. That was something blocking light from us. So um, the first idea that there was dust in other nearby galaxies, that was something that happened right here um, around a little over 100 years ago, which is pretty cool. So, um, And now we can study it even more. Um, let me see, is this going to? Let me try to get this to loop, okay. 
um, with new telescopes so we can learn even more about this dust. So with all the telescopes we have now, we've been able to better constrain um, what types of dust are in nearby galaxies. And like I said, there are, um, I said large here. They're large comparatively. They're large compared to the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, but these are still very small dust grains. But um, comparatively large carbonaceous and silicate grains, which is kind of similar to wildfire smoke. So if you think wildfire smoke, you're burning trees. Trees are made of carbon, so you're getting very small particles of trees. It's Sorry. Um, so it's the dust in galaxies, the larger dust grains are sort of similar to that wildfire smoke. It has some similar, and they, they also block short wavelength light, which wildfire smoke also does. Um, the other type of dust we see a lot of in galaxies is the small polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These also show up on Earth. Um, they are in car exhaust. They're also in other pollutant materials. Um, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, um, this is a PAH uh, model, so they're chains of carbons and hydrogens. What's really cool about them is they help regulate the temperature in galaxies. And this is what kind of allows, either stops or starts star formation. And these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons play a huge role in that. Now, the other cool thing about PAHs is that they wiggle. And so when they, um, this is what, this is an example of a PAH wiggling. Um, and so when they absorb light from young stars, they do these little wiggle things. As they're wiggling, they're emitting infrared light. So not only do they emit infrared light uh, as temperature, but we see especially mid-infrared light, so shorter infrared wavelengths emitted by polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So we're getting the ability to really carefully trace the distribution of these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons hydrocarbons with the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's what my research really focuses on. So I'm a big fan of PAHs, except when they're in our atmosphere, um, because they're not super good for us. Um, this is kind of a fun story. Um, my mom, before she retired, worked in um, environmental at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. So when I told her I was studying PAHs, she was like, oh, I know what those are. We have to get those out of our environment. Um, she also really doesn't like when I call them PAWS, which I sometimes do, um, because they're PAHs, um, and she's, she's right. Um, but they can lead to a cancer risk here on Earth. They're very pretty and important component of galaxies, but we don't really want them in our atmosphere. So uh, just kind of a weird. Um, I was actually listening to a podcast about scallops last week, too, and they were talking about PAHs and scallops, so they show up all over the place. Um, but that's all asides, so sorry. Um, if instead we want to think about what interstellar dust is doing, so not here on Earth, like I said, that it has some similar properties to that wildfire smoke. So the bigger, the larger dust grains behave like wildfire smoke. I'm sorry, this is kind of a bad image for anyone in California. We're all used to this now, unfortunately. Um, but when there's a lot of smoke in our atmosphere, um, you might notice the sky looks redder. And that's because that smoke, not only is it terrible to breathe, but it's blocking short wavelengths, blue and yellow light. It's scattering it, it's absorbing it, so that doesn't get through and it makes the sky, but the longer wavelength, lower energy red light is able to pass through. So that's why the sky looks red. The same exact thing happens in galaxies. The dust in galaxies blocks the short wavelength optical blue light, the visible light, but it allows red infrared light to pass through. So this is a dust cloud in a galaxy. Same kind of effect as that wildfire smoke. Looks really dark because we're not seeing um, any of that blue light that would be getting through, but if we look in the infrared, we can now see through this dust cloud to all the stars behind it. So dust blocks optical light and it emits infrared light. So by studying galaxies in the infrared, we can really see this infrared, the dust, and we can also get an idea of what's happening um, behind the dust. And so just to show this in one other way, this is data I'm working with now, so I'm very excited about this. This is the galaxy NGC 3627, or M66. Um, I don't know if it has a cool name. Um, eh, sorry. Um, so here I've got three different parts of the infrared spectrum. I've got the near infrared here, so this is the closest to red. So this is kind of 
just redder than what we can observe. And when we look in the infrared, we're not so much seeing dust, but we are seeing through the dust. So this near-infrared light is showing us old stars, and it's also showing us an image sort of of what the galaxy would look like if it wasn't filled with dust. So we're able to get a distribution of the star, get an idea of what the distribution of the stars is like if it wasn't filled with dust. And we can see especially this bar in the center has a ton of stars in it. Um, it's very bright when we're looking in the near-infrared. When we look in the mid-infrared, so we get to kind of slightly longer wavelengths. So this is longer than the near-infrared. All of this is stuff we can't see. All of this is infrared. What we're seeing in the mid-infrared is mostly the small dust grains, those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So this is... Um, this is JWST data um, from the program I'm working on. Um, this is also JWST data. This is NearCam. This is Miri, if you're interested. Um, and this is tracing those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So what we can see different distribution than the stars, for sure. Um, we're now looking at a different portion of the infrared spectrum. Um, and we can start to get an idea of where these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are and how they might relate to how this galaxy is forming stars. If we look in the far infrared, unfortunately, JWST doesn't look in the far infrared. Sophia did, um, and this is also, this is a Herschel image, so this is um, Herschel Pax, um, if you're interested. So Herschel was also, it was a space telescope um, that also, that recently, that shut down, I think, in 2013. Um, but Herschel was able to get emission from the larger dust grains. So this is, instead of seeing what the large dust grains are blocking, we're seeing the light they're emitting. So this is that thermal emission, that temperature emission from large dust grains. Unfortunately, in the far infrared, it's really difficult to get high-resolution data, so I can't show you the same, spit, like, small little features that I can show you from JWST, but it's still really cool to see, and we can get an idea, instead of seeing the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, we're seeing those larger dust grains, those more wildfire smoke-like dust grains. Now, dust is also really important for that kind of question of chemical evolution in a galaxy because it plays a part in every step of the formation of stars and planets, and um, it's produced in stellar death. So we see this is something that astronomers call the baryon cycle, um, and so baryon being stuff that makes us up. So we're going from interstellar medium, which is where all our dust is stored. If things get dense enough, if the um, dust grain, if there's enough dust and gas that things get dense enough, you can start to have star birth, so that's like that Orion Nebula that we flew through at the beginning. You can, um, you can get things in the right conditions where you can get uh, star birth. If stars are forming, you're probably also forming planets. Those planets are kind of forming out of this dust if you have a rocky planet, so um, dust is really important for how um, planets form as well. And then when stars eventually die in supernova or in other explosions, that's actually where the dust is coming from, for the most part. So we, we're still not sure where all of the dust in our galax in galaxies comes from, but we're pretty sure a good portion of it comes from dying stars, either in the form of supernova or in stars called wolf Rayet stars, which are going through the last portions of their life and end up puffing out their outer layers as they do. So stellar death enriches galaxies in dust. We can measure that dust in the interstellar medium, in the infrared. When the conditions are right because of the dust and gas, we can get star and planet formation coming from this dust. So it's a really important for every kind of step in the cycle um, of how we're changing what's happening in galaxies, how we're changing the um, chemicals within galaxies. Um, this is the worst plot I have in this talk. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but I had to throw it in because I really like it. So JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, is our big shiny new space telescope that launched on Christmas Day in 2021 and started sending data back um, a little over a year ago. Um, so May. 2022 was when we got the first um, images. Um, and JWST is just the best telescope for seeing PAHs. It is so good at this. It was like, it was designed to do this in some ways. Um, and so what this plot is showing, so this is JWST or an image, of uh, artist image of JWST. Um, and this plot is showing what JWST can measure. So this y-axis is brightness, and this is the x-axis is wavelength. So these are all infrared colors. This is kind of the color of the light. And this is what we might expect emission from a galaxy to look like. So the dust in galaxies will be bright at certain wavelengths. So at certain colors, the dust 
the dust in the galaxy will be very bright. We can see these pointy things. Those pointy things are created when the PAHs do their little wiggle dance. So the wiggling PAHs make these pointy features that are especially bright. And JWST is really well designed for measuring them. So these um, colored profiles, these colored little rectangles, show you what colors JWST can measure. So anything that's under one of those um, little colored curves is a color that JWST can measure. So we can see there's um, JWST can observe at 3.3 microns in the near infrared. There's a really bright PAH feature there, um, polycyclic armored hydrogen, and it can also do 7.7 .7 microns. So this is another really big important one, and then also 11.3. So all of these colors are colors that JWST can observe and trace the wiggling of those little polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So by mapping these by using JWST in this way, we can get an idea of what that, how those PAHs are distributed. Um, JWST is also very exciting because it's totally changing our vision of nearby galaxies, of the universe as a whole, but I'm here to talk about nearby galaxies because that's what I study. Um, so this here is one of the galaxies, again, from my team's sample, um, NGC 628. You might have seen it because it's shown up a bit in the press. I'll show a bunch of pictures of it because it's gorgeous. Um, but uh, it's also called the Phantom Galaxy. It does have a fun name. So on this side, this is the best infrared image we had of NGC 628 before JWST. So what we can see is it's good, it's great, this is beautiful data, but the resolution is much, much lower. If you wear glasses, maybe this looks like you forgot your glasses on this side and you didn't on that side. So JWST is just vastly improving the spatial resolution um, in the infrared. So um, the other thing JWST does is it's also um, higher sensitivity than Spitzer was. So we're also able to see that some of these areas that look dark, they do look dark, they're much fainter than the bright arms, but there is still PAH emission in a lot of those dark areas. So we're actually able to really map out those PAHs and see that one of, um, one of our papers we jokingly called, there's PAHs everywhere. And that was like essentially the conclusion of the paper. Um, so we're very excited uh, about getting to work with this new incredible um, telescope that is just so well suited for measuring dust in galaxies. It's just perfect for it. It's really great. Um, yeah, and I know, I think the other thing I want to say here is there's been a lot of um, images on the internet that are comparing JWST to the Hubble Space Telescope. That's a really cool um, comparison. I think it's awesome. But you have to remember, Hubble's an optical observatory. So comparing JWST and Hubble is kind of a false equivalency because what Hubble was seeing was a different part of the galaxy. So I really like this comparison because it's comparing essentially the same colors. So this is eight microns from Herschel and 7.7 .7 microns from JWST. So these are the same wavelengths, the same colors, and you can just really see how much the resolution has changed, how much JWST is improving on what we had before before um, it was available. And with this, we can map the structure in the interstellar medium in just ways that we couldn't before. Um, so I work with a program called FANGS. Um, I said astronomers like acronyms. Sorry. Um, so FANGS stands for, the phys for Physics at High Angular Resolution in Nearby Galaxies. I don't know what happened to the R. I guess they didn't want to call it FARGS, um, but eh, that was a decision that was made before I joined. Um, FANGS is an amazing group. It's um, astronomers from around the world, um, all working together to try to study what's going on inside galaxies. And we now work with JWST. I'm really, I'm mostly working with the JWST data because that's how we can see the dust, and that's what I'm excited about. Um, but we have observations across the electromagnetic spectrum from the far ultraviolet to the um, millimeter. So um, we have Hubble images, we have images from a telescope um, called the VLT, um, the Very Large Telescope in Chile. We have uh, images from ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, um, which is also in Chile. Um, and now we also have observations of 19 galaxies with JWST. So these are our 19 galaxies um, with images from uh, the uh, from Muse, which was that, uh, on the VLT in Chile. So those are optical, but we want to see them in the infrared. So there's going to be a lot of pictures of galaxies for like the next 
10 minutes. Um, <laughs> but I think they're cool. So this is NGC 628. Like I said, this was kind of our poster child. It was one of the first galaxy images we got from JWST. And we were just overjoyed when we saw it. Because look at it. It's gorgeous. Um, there's this really interesting hole in the center that doesn't seem to have very much dust at all. There's this hole here that um, we call, we're calling the phantom void. I think it looks kind of like the Starship Enterprise, just like <laughs> popped a hole in it. Um, but I'm not sure we can argue. Um, it's one of our closer galaxies, and it's also what we call a grand design spiral because it has these really just very beautiful spiral arms that you can track across the whole galaxy. All of the galaxies in our sample are going to be star-forming galaxies. We don't include um, ellipticals because we're looking for the signs of star formation. That's part of what we do. Um, our angular resolution is actually set to be the size of star-forming regions, so... I don't have any of those in this, um, in this talk, but these are also the pretty ones, so it's okay. Um, this is one of the other early ones we got, NGC 1365. It's a little further away, so 19.6 megaparsecs. That's about 60 million light years, approximately. Um, it's a barred spiral galaxy, so it's a spir that just means it's a spiral galaxy with a bar down the middle. Um, and it also has an active galactic nuclei in the center, so that means there is a supermassive black hole in here, right around there, and it's accreting material very, very quickly. So it's eating things very, very fast. That's actually a huge problem for us. I know. Gal like th there's people who study those things and are very excited about it. And for me, I'm like, oh, this is, it's making the data harder to use because the AGN is so bright, that supermassive black hole that we're getting these spikes across our image that are actually like, if you ever take a picture of the sun and it has like bright things coming off it, same exact things. Um, for us, that's an artifact. We want to actually remove those. Um, they're kind of making it hard. They're making it hard to measure the dust in this galaxy, which is really the important thing. Um, but anyways, um, um, that's my opinion, and again, other astronomers will disagree with me, and that's fine. Um, this is another one of our early galaxies, NGC 7496, another barred spiral galaxy with an AGN. I really like this hole here. I think it looks very interesting. Um, there's a whole group that's just studying the bubbles in these galaxies, so if you see a lot of things that look like bubbles, that's what we call them too. Um, we don't have a better name for them, but they seem to be bubbles that happen around areas where there was star formation and now we're kind of clearing out material. Um, this is IC5332. The names aren't very exciting, I'm sorry. Um, but IC5332 is one of our lower metallicity galaxies, so we don't really have... This is, I say in quotations because it's not that low. But what low metallicity means is that it doesn't have a lot of heavy elements. So for an astronomer, I know... When we hear metal as humans, we're thinking like steel or something. For an astronomer, a metal is anything that's not hydrogen or helium. So we would be metallic if we were talking in astro astronomical terms. So a low metallicity galaxy is a galaxy that's still mostly hydrogen. And that's really interesting because that's what we think the earliest galaxies were. We think the early galaxies at the beginning of the universe, little baby galaxies, were pretty much just hydrogen. So by finding nearby galaxies that are low metallicity that only really have hydrogen and helium, um, or have mostly, they have other heavy elements, but mostly hydrogen and helium, we can get a kind of snapshot of what those little baby galaxies might have looked like. So IC5332 is really interesting because it's a lower metallicity galaxy. Um, this is one of my other less exciting pictures. I'll flip back to pretty galaxies in a second, I promise. Um, but um, this was one of the science projects I got to work on when I joined the UCSD team, when I moved to UCSD um, and joined the FANGS team. And that was looking at how the distribution of PAHs, or PAHs, sorry, um, changed it across these galaxies. And so what we did is we looked at the colors that were traced, that are emitted by those wiggly paw feature, PAH features, and we divided it by um, the emission from larger dust grains, and we were able to see where there were a lot of PAHs and where there were fewer. And one of the big things we saw, so this is NGC 628 again, is that um, if there's a purpler color here, there's fewer PAHs. If it's more yellow, there's more. Um, and what we saw is when you look in these little white outlined areas, those are stellar nurseries. So those are star forming regions, so that's where there's a lot of baby stars. So we can see within the stellar nurseries where the baby stars are, that's where all the purpler colors are. So the baby stars seem to be destroying the PAHs. So wherever there's baby stars, we seem to lose polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is really interesting because that tells us that some of the heating that those polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons are doing must be happening further away since they are interacting with these young stars, but they're 
partially getting destroyed by them. So this was a result that I was like, excited to be a part of. <laughs> um, but now, more pretty pictures. So um, these are images that I made. The first four I showed were all created by an artist named Judy Schmidt. She's incredible. She is much better at making three color images than I am. I do my best, um, but I am not as good as Judy is. Um, so apologies for that. She hasn't gotten to our newer data yet. She does amazing work, though. I in totally encourage you to check her out, because she's made beautiful images of everything. Um, what I can tell you, though, for these data, because I made these images, I can tell you that the blue in this is our near-infrared light. So blue is tracing that older stellar population. And then the red colors is coming from the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So anywhere you see red is where there's a lot of PAHs. Anywhere you see blue, there's a lot of old stars. And I know I hear every once in a while some people tell me, they're like, oh, astronomers are lying to us because they're making these false color images. It's like, well, if I showed you this in the infrared, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, so that wouldn't be very exciting. So yes, I'm lying to you, I suppose, but um, the bluer light is bluer and the redder light is redder, technically. It's just all light that we humans can't observe, so it's all infrared light. Um, I really like this the swirliness in the center of this galaxy. We haven't come up for a, with a good term for this yet, but we're really seeing that all these galaxy centers are very swirly and it's cool. Um, this is NGC 1300. One of the things I really like about this galaxy is that it's got some little photobombing galaxies. So this right here is a really distant galaxy that got in our image. So this is a contaminant for us. We want to remove it because we are trying to measure the emission from this larger nearby galaxy, but it's a little one. You can also see um, up here, this right here, there's a little spiral galaxy behind that. And so if we want to measure the emission from this galaxy, we're going to have to be very carefully removing background sources and making sure they're not changing the colors we're seeing um, when we look um, at emission from this galaxy. Um, this is NGC 1087. I believe it might be 1385. Um, I think it's 1087. Oh boy. Um, it's one of our irregular galaxies. So this is a galaxy that's not, doesn't really fall into the spiral or elliptical category. We can see it doesn't really have spiral arms. Um, irregular galaxies, um, I also, I, I showed images um, to a class once and I asked them to classify the galaxies and they called these hot mess galaxies. So whatever, maybe they did better. We should change the name in astronomy. Um, but these galaxies tend to be bursty in star formation. So we can actually see that this galaxy is very bright in all of the colors. That's why we're getting this kind of white. So there's both a lot of stars and a lot of dust, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it's NGC 1512. It's, it's, uh, I don't have words. It's just very pretty. Um, I'm sorry, I really like the center here. This is another barred spiral. Um, 1566. Um, this one's proving very hard to do calibration for, and this is one of the problems that we're finding, is we want to know, um, if you ever have used one of those scales, like in chemistry class, where you had to tell it what zero was, like you remove, or you, if you're a baker, and you have a, a baking scale, and you set, you tar it, you set it to zero, we want to be able to find what zero is in these maps. Unfortunately, our galaxies fill the entire image. <laughs> and so finding something with no emission is very, very, very difficult. So we can't really tell what the background level is, what the zero level should be. So that's a challenge we're still working on. This is 1672. Um, it's NGC 1672, excuse me. Um, I really like, it's what we call a flocculent galaxy because it looks very fuzzy. Um, kind of there's not really, there are some defined spiral arms, but there's also just a lot of material between them. This is NGC 2835. This is one of our most recently observed ones. It was observed um, earlier this month, so hot off the presses, JWST data. Um, another slightly irregular, although I think you can argue there's some spiral arms going on. Um, I really like this one. This is NGC 3351. I'm sorry. I'm just like, gosh, these are like my baby pictures you all have to look at for a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, but this one I think is cool because it's got like three rings in the center, which is just very impressive. I'm also really excited about this galaxy because it was observed with Herschel. So we also have a lot of information about the larger dust grains and also about the gas in this galaxy. So we're able to put all of that together and make a big infrared all the way across the infrared spectrum for this galaxy. So I'm super stoked to do that. This is 3627, which I showed earlier. Um, 
there's huge amounts of star formation happening in the edges of these arms, so where the arms hit the bar. So that's telling us that we're somehow fu funneling material along the um, arms and into this bar. And when that material hits those edges, the conditions are just perfect for star birth. Um, and we can see that both in the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon emission and in the blue light, which is, again, why we get white there. And then this is NGC 5068. Um, this is our nearest galaxy in our sample, so it's about 15 million light years away, so right in our backyard. Um, right in for astronomers, yes. Um, uh, and this is also um, another one of our low metallicity galaxies, so it's giving us a little bit of a peek of what maybe the early universe looked like. Um, yeah, so just to kind of... Yes, wrap things up and hopefully give you a reason why you should care a little bit more is that this is all helping us answer this question of how we get here. So how do we get the stuff that um, makes us up? And this is one of the other big things that we're trying to do um, in extragalactic astronomy is that we use telescopes as time machines to look back in time. So I'm looking at galaxies that are essentially, in, that are in the local universe that we're seeing essentially now, so 15 million years ago, so now. Um, but if we look further away, um, we can see galaxies that were billions of years, that we're, seeing, we're seeing light from galaxies that is billions of years old. So we're seeing galaxies as they were billions of years in the past. And JWST is really changing that. So this is an out of date um, graphic that shows how as we go from ground-based observatories, we're seeing about six billion years into the past. Then with Hubble, we get to around um, 480 million years after the Big Bang. And now that we have JWST, we're seeing even earlier. So this is from a different JWST survey, the Jade survey, but there's, we, we're looking at the nearby galaxies. They're looking for very distant galaxies. And what you can see is when you look at these very distant galaxies, they don't look as pretty as our galaxies. Um, I, I think, um, <laughs> again, maybe I'm biased, but uh, we want to put together a picture of how we go from these little red dots, what these little red dots, what they look like, to the galaxies that I showed you, the galaxies in our sample. So how do we get from those, these baby pictures of galaxies to the galaxies we see today and our own Milky Way galaxy? And we can do that by studying galaxies both nearby and then connecting that to the galaxies we see in the very early times of the universe when we use our telescopes like time machines. So that's, we don't yet have a complete answer to why we have spirals and ellipticals and what might turn a spiral into elliptical, but we're getting clues and it seems to be that it's related to collisions, it's related to galaxies merging, um, and as we get even more data from JWST, we'll hopefully push forward with this and see how galaxies are changing our universe over time and get a better picture of what we are moving towards in the future. So with that, I will leave you with the most recent JWST image from the FANG survey, this is NGC 4254, it was observed, it came down from JWST to us on Monday. So this is something that um, probably hasn't been on Twitter yet, um, but I don't know, maybe it has. Um, but it's, a, one of our, it's our last galaxy in our sample, so we were super excited to get this, um, and I'm happy to take questions that folks have. <laughs> We, there are folks who use x-ray, um, we don't, there's not a lot, so um, with the FANGS team, um, part of that acronym is high resolution, there's not a lot of good high resolution x-ray data. So um, I don't use x-ray because x-ray doesn't trace dust. Um, X-ray traces very, very hot gas. It would also be emitted by the supermassive black hole in the center, but it doesn't do much for the dust. So um, there are folks using X-ray. I am not one of those people. Um, and we don't do a lot with it in our survey because there's not that high angular resolution data to match what we've got. Is it fair to say that Yes, yeah. And the plot you were showing is the emission spectrum. Yes, so the, yeah. But that's the reaction on the different uh, incoming waves. Um, so it's PAHs, there's a bunch of different forms of PAHs. So this is getting, that's actually a model spectra of PAHs. Um, they actually do tests of PAH emission spectra at NASA Ames, so right in the bay. Um, but that's different PAHs will emit different different peaks, and then there's also different wiggling modes that will emit different peaks. So the um, different chemical bonds, depending on whether you're having, whether it's a CH flexing bond or a um, 
an HH. I think there's different peaks depending on which, which type, how, how the PAH is converting that light. So that's the different peaks come from those different wiggles, essentially. So can we think that shorter wavelength just doesn't pass, including X-rays and... Um, some of it will get through, some of it will get blocked. So some proportion of it will be blocked. Not all of it, but some fraction. Um, and often, shorter wavelength, higher fraction. But yeah. Yeah, so the PAHs are a very, so the dust in a galaxy is a very, very, very small fraction of what's there. PAHs are a very, very, very small fraction of that. So dust is about 0.5% of the interstellar medium. So most of the stuff in the interstellar medium is hydrogen gas. The PAHs just help it get to the right conditions by thermally regulating things. So by allowing for there to be ways for things to cool and heat up, they allow things to get to the right conditions where star formation can occur. So the star formation is mostly happening from that hydrogen gas because that's most of what's there, um, but the pH is just help allow things get to the right conditions, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we so we're still studying that. So we we're calling them bubbles, um, and we think that it's um, from stellar winds. So from pressure as stars are forming, um, there's like radiation pressure that might be clearing areas. Um, also with supernova, you can like clear an area with a supernova. So as you blow things up, you might clear an area of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and other dust and gas. Um, there's uh, some of so. After we got our first four galaxies, we did kind of a rush and we published 23 papers in a couple of months. Um, so it was a bit of a crazy time. Um, but uh, there were a couple papers looking at whether or not um, the mechanical energy that you input into a galaxy from supernovas would be enough to clear those bubbles. And it's not quite the right amount, so we're still not completely sure, but it's some amount of um, stellar feedback, we call it. As stars are forming, they're also clearing material. And as they blow up, they kind of push things out and make potentially make bubbles. We do see this in simulations as well. There's some really cool images where our data looks exactly like simulations of galaxies and it's just, it's so exciting. <laughs> um, yeah. You said you made the image, what do you mean by that? Yeah, sorry. Um, so when we get the data, we get one wavelength or we get one type of wavelength at a time. So what we see when I look at the data, I, typically only look in grayscale. So I'm just seeing, is it bright or is it faint? So if we want a three color image, you have to find a way to layer them together. So I assign, I get to assign what's blue, what's green and what's red, and then also what, what's bright and what's faint. So there's some galaxies that it's easy to do and there's some that it's actually kind of tricky because if you let the bright things be bright, you don't see any of the faint things. Um, and if you see all the, faint stuff, then the bright stuff gets oversaturated. So it's just kind of playing um, sort of with your saturation in each image. So like, it's kind of like editing images to, like with filters on Instagram, but I'm also adding, stacking them together and um, assigning colors to them as well. So also Photoshop, you can do this as well on that. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes, Black holes don't. Um, so the black holes don't, but material falling onto the black holes will. Um, so that's, um, as, the, as things are getting sucked towards the black hole, they tend to move very quickly. <laughs> and as you're moving quickly, you end up um, emitting a lot of light. So that's part of it. Um, most of these galaxies, it's not necessarily the black hole that you're seeing super bright in the center. What you're seeing is that there's um, a, nuclear star forming, re a nuclear star forming region, yeah, sorry. Um, I read this in a paper yesterday, so I should know. Um, but, um, so you're seeing that there's, um, in the center of galaxies, there tends to be, like, more stars, there tends to be a really dense stellar cluster in the center. So it's not so much the light happening around the black hole you're seeing. For the most part, a few of those galaxies, 
the AGN, there's an AGN in the center and they're very, very bright and it's frustrating. Um, but um, for the most part, what you're seeing in that bright light is just stars. Um, lots and lots of stars. No, absolutely not. <laughs> there's you, and the, there's so much other stuff on our line of sight that even yeah no and then the, and also that's very 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 small in our image. So no, it would be less than a pixel. <laughs> we need empty sky. Well, time is upon us, so I think we've been privileged to see some, as you said, hot off the presses. Yeah. Thank you.